Greetings fellow travelers, today we will take our first look at the Moat Marine Laboratory from Rivers of Seas where we will begin our journey. Before I go into the history of this facility, I will explain what we are experiencing. This is the first live coral exhibit along our path, and if we look closely we will spot more than a dozen coral species found in Florida reefs. It reveals how Moat Marine Laboratory scientists study corals why these coral reefs are struggling amid environmental changes, and how scientists here at Moat are advancing coral science and restoration to help bring them back from the brink of extinction. Then we will be walking through freshwater Florida, where we learn that Florida's rivers stretch more than 25,000 miles total and connect with water bodies such as swamps, lakes, and the sea. Here we will learn that many of these species are common in home aquariums, as well as find out the impacts of invasive species like the jeweled cichlid and water pollution. The laboratory was founded in 1955 by Eugenia Clark out of her love from visiting her local aquarium as a child. This love turned to passion for marine science, and this one-room lab was located in Cape Hayes, Florida. Here, Dr. Clark partnered with her community, especially a fisherman named Beryl Chadwick, who collected sharks for her research. Since 1960, this facility has been based in Sarasota. The aquarium opened in 1980 on City Island in Sarasota Bay. This new facility was supported by William R. Moat, a businessman and fisherman who chose to give back to the sea, displaying more than 100 species with a focus on species and ecosystems studied by staff scientists. Under the leadership of Dr. Perry Gilbert, Moat scientists expanded research on wildlife, including dolphins, manatees, and sea turtles. That part we will visit in a later video, as well as environmental issues including Florida red tide. This facility has worked hard to educate and inspire the public and give visitors a new window into their science. Moat Laboratory and Aquarium have committed themselves to serving the oceans and society, investigating new ocean-derived sources of sustainable seafood, medicine, and more. Today, Dr. Crosby leads their global research enterprise, from coral reef restoration to red tide mitigation, fish and wildlife research to immunology, and more. Moat is based in six Florida locations and works worldwide. This tank houses bluefin killifish, which are common in Florida lakes, streams, and springs. Males have blue-colored fins, while females do not. They share their habitat with the eastern newt. Here we spot the banded and black-banded sunfish, as well as the blue-spotted sunfish. These sunfish are found in slow-moving sections of creeks, rivers, lakes, and ponds along the northeast coast of North America down in Florida, and after the female lays her eggs, the males will guard the eggs until they hatch. In the middle of the first room, we will come across the home of Diamondback Terrapin, and depending on the day of your visit, you can spot either Cecil or Pearl. This is the only turtle in the United States that lives in brackish water, a mixture of salt and fresh water found in saltwater marshes, coastal bays, and lagoons. Terrapins excrete excess salt through a salt gland near their eyes, which makes it appear as if they are crying. Each individual has a unique pattern of blotches on its skin, much like we all have unique fingerprints. These are also sexually diamorphic animals, with males being visibly smaller than females. Females can grow to the size of a dinner plate, while males only grow to about half that size. This exhibit teaches us about juvenile fishes and mangroves, with the species on display being the mangrove snapper. This habitat lines much of the coast in southwest Florida, and juvenile fish play an important role in the food web, serving as a primary prey item for larger sports fish. Protecting these habitats and the species that live there is vitally important in preserving an active and healthy recreational fishery. Here at the sports fish tank, we learned that due to the loss of seagrass beds, pollution, and human development, populations of sports fish have plummeted. Moat Marine Laboratory and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission are working together and have created marine fisheries enhancement programs to re-establish saltwater fish populations and restore critical marine habitat. The artificial reefs exhibit is home of the red grouper and green moray eel. Man-made underwater structures provide habitat for marine life. Shipwrecks, for example, provide hard surfaces where algae and invertebrates such as barnacles and oysters attach. The accumulation of attached marine life in turn provides structure and food for fish. 
in this multi-species tank will spot a convict fish and learn that Dr. Eugenia Clark and her collaborators are the first to describe the behavior, size, and habitat of adult convict fish in the wild. In the wild, adult convict fish never venture beyond the maze of tunnels that make up their homes. Instead, they spend their days digging and cleaning up. The juveniles, however, leave home each morning at sunrise to search for plankton, their main food source. Surprisingly, they return to their own parents every evening at dusk. The convict fish, native to the Southwest Pacific, is known for some surprising behaviors. Adults, for example, sometimes take the young into their mouths. Instead of eating them, the young fish are released unharmed. Dr. Eugenia Clark thought the babies might be feeding the parents the way adult birds feed their babies. If so, this would be the only known example of babies feeding parents among vertebrates. She observed some other unusual activities among the convict fish. Tightly packed clusters of juveniles have been spotted hanging perfectly still inside their tunnels, each connected to the roof by a thin strand of mucus. This may be a way of conserving energy in a sleep-like state, as we do in bed. Here we also learn that Moat has discovered a novel way to quickly grow reef-building coral species, like brain corals, which are naturally very slow-growing. With this technique, Moat scientists are working to restore large areas of these important corals in just one to three years, instead of the hundreds of years it might take nature on its own. So how does it work? This involves breaking brain, boulder, and star coral into small pieces called microfragments, which grow rapidly, then placing pieces onto the dead skeleton of a coral head in the wild. These pieces fuse or reskin the skeleton. Next up is one of my favorites and what I like to call a mini Cthulhu. These dwarf cuttlefish are native to the Indo-Pacific in the waters around Indonesia and the Philippines. The individuals that we see here were born and raised at the Moat Aquarium. These unique animals change both color and texture in an incredible demonstration of camouflage. Nearby, we will spot a very active common octopus. These soft-bodied undersea predators are boneless but not brainless. They have a well-developed brain, eight arms, and a hardened beak for feeding. They can change color to blend into their surroundings. They are intelligent enough to unscrew a jar containing food, and in the wild, they use their muscular arms dotted with suckers to catch lobsters, crabs, and mollusks. They live in tropical and temperate waters around the world. They may be found along intertidal reefs and on the seafloor in layers or dens in rocks. They are flexible enough to squeeze into very tiny spaces. Next up, we'll spot the chocolate chip starfish and the striped shrimp fish, which lives in the reefs of the Indo-Pacific, where they form large congregations among whip corals and sea grasses. And here we have made it into the creatures from the coastal oceans hall. And we will see angelfish, butterfly fish, porcupine fish, spiny lobsters, and other examples of incredible biodiversity that relies on the barrier reefs of southeastern Florida. We will also see some species that are not native to Florida, like the invasive lionfish. And here we see what a healthy reef should look like, where hundreds of fish species inhabit Florida's coral reefs. Unfortunately, many of these fish populations are declining due to the invasive lionfish. Lionfish are hardy, generalist predator, with no known consistent predators in the invaded range. They have the capacity to significantly reduce juvenile populations and overall diversity, preying on over 90 species of reef fish and invertebrates.
Florida's coral reefs are experiencing an unprecedented outbreak of stony coral tissue loss disease with mortality rates as high as 100%. Moat scientists are on the front lines of research efforts to identify the pathogen and restore reefs with genetically resilient corals. Moat is working with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission and others in a large-scale effort to house healthy, genetically diverse corals from the wild. These corals will be propagated for future reef restoration. This tank houses yellowhead jawfish. This exhibit teaches the dangers of plastic bags in the ocean, upside down jellyfish, similar to coral and anemones. These jellyfish harbor a symbiotic algae and spend most of their time laying on the bottom of shallow, calm coastal waters, orientating their algae filled tentacles toward the sun. Atlantic sea needle has formed a mutualistic symbiotic relationship with blue crabs. The jelly provides shelter and food for the crab, and the crab cleans the jelly debris and parasites. Main predators include leatherback sea turtles and ocean sunfish, as well as other jellyfish. This is part of the Closer Look Nook, and this exhibit displays a reverse light cycle which allows us to view these soft corals in both day and nighttime settings. Unlike true jellies, comb jellies do not have the ability to sting. Instead, they use specialized cells called coleoblasts that release a sticky mucus-like substance to trap prey. And the final exhibit for the jellies is that of the moon jelly. Seagrass spreads provide food and shelter for young and adult animals and benefit water quality and clarity. Here we'll find out what hides in West Central Florida seagrass beds, including animals that are found near Moat's home base on Sarasota Bay. And here we come to the wave zone, where crashing waves carry food and oxygen. Some animals and plants have adapted to live in the wave zone. These creatures have developed physical attributes and behaviors to withstand, avoid, or ride the surging waves. At the Florida Coral Reefs exhibit, we'll see a diverse range of animals that make their homes on the coral reefs surrounding Florida. Their many shapes and colors allow them to communicate and camouflage on the reef. And in the last room, we'll meet Molly, a 27-foot long preserved giant squid. She was an adult female that weighed more than 500 pounds and was 37 feet long with her tentacles extended. She was accidentally caught off the coast of southeastern New Zealand in 1999 and donated to the Moat Marine Laboratory and Aquarium. When we come back to the Moat Aquarium, we will head outdoors and visit the coastal ecosystems. Thank you for joining me on this first look at the Moat Aquarium. This is Brad, and I will see you where our adventures take us next. Until next time, safe travels, everyone.